what I really would like to accomplish here is look at the different scenarios. I can say, hey, this is why I think it might be possible. Maybe you think it's guaranteed to happen. Maybe you think there's no chance it happens. We're not going to, I mean, we can discuss that certainly, but I would like at least initially to keep the focus more on just whatever you believe, taking some questions and looking through how, you know, you might go about constructing uh, something that fits what you think is going to happen. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you from Mexico for our first Mexican option call, which is quite exciting, uh, especially at this particular time with the things going on. I'm sure everybody has heard about Basil III. Um, we'll do a quick review. Rob, maybe in a moment you can try and put into English what all this uh, British banker jargon actually means. I did go through that report the LBMA put out. Oh my God, it, it hurt just to read, to imagine someone's life would be just sitting reading legal documents that no one could understand uh, is mind numbing. But, you know, to the degree, and again, it's not a matter of what I necessarily think is going to happen that day. Part of the best, or what I really would like to accomplish here is look at the different scenarios. I can say, hey, this is why I think it might be possible. Maybe you think it's guaranteed to happen. Maybe you think there's no chance it happens. We're not gonna, I mean, we can discuss that certainly, but I would like at least initially to keep the focus more on just whatever you believe, taking some questions and looking through how, you know, you might go about constructing uh, something that fits what you think is gonna happen. So hopefully that makes sense. I must also give this disclaimer. Actually, I don't know if I have to since I'm no longer on American soil, but just for uh, Ross the Boss and MRAC and CCP and all the other fine individuals at the CFTC who are keeping you all safe from internet, uh, Reddit, social media, Fruit Loops like myself, um, this is not licensed financial advice. This is very, uh, options are obviously very different than uh, physical gold or silver. It's even a step up in terms of risk parameters from mining shares. So, you know, do this at your own risk. Make sure you're talking to people that you trust and can help. I will give my honest uh, answer and feedback on any of these matters, but, you know, it's a bit of a volatile exercise. And especially if you're using options, I mean, there's a ton of different ways that they can be used. I mean, for the most part, I've been buying out of the money call options waiting to time a big move. Now, in my defense, and I believe there must uh, clarify here because there's something to be said for, you know, it's great to get advice from different people on different things. I think there's also when someone has successfully over time implemented and has developed and demonstrated a skill. So in terms of the silver thing, I guess it's a matter of perspective. I had a big position on at least big relative for me in 2011 when the thing was soaring. And that's what started Arcadia where when the thing got clobbered from 50 bucks, it in the middle of everything that was happening, uh, it just seemed a little bit odd. And that was what led me to think either the thing is manipulated and it was going past 50 based on what was happening in the world. The debt ceiling was becoming a disaster. Bernanke was launching QE2. This is when people on Wall Street actually even cared about stuff like that. Actually, I don't even think they cared about it then, but I was left feeling either this was rigged lower or I'm missing something. Here we are 10 years later, if I'm missing something, I haven't been able to figure it out. And either Jeff Christian's right or I'm right, I guess, or maybe there's some other possibility. Um, so now if you're buying out of the money call options in the in, uh, anticipation of a big move, well, your risk there is that it goes on longer. And you know, most of the time I've gotten clobbered on those um, for the last 10 years. I never expected it would be quite this long. Um, but I mean, like anything, I think even before actual trading, 
It's kind of like life often goes well when you go into something with a plan. So I also knew what I'm prepared to do. And I left Wall Street, did other things, created a completely different career path of rather than a salary or, you know, there were many years where I didn't have income coming in. So that's going to be different for each person. But um, A, if I didn't mention this before, this is not legal financial advice. So you got to talk to your legal people. I'm just giving you research, sharing what I do and answering questions in genuine fashion. But I mean, again, it's going to be different for everyone. But think about, you know, if you're very conservative, then you're going to approach it a certain way. I mean, if you're going and spending like 20 grand a weekend at the blackjack table and you have a higher risk tolerance, there's different things you can do. What I've liked about the situation why I've continued doing this is that depending on how big these things move, I don't know if silver, you know, if the COMEX unravels or like if Basel three actually ends the paper, gold and silver market. I don't know, does silver go to 50? Does it go to 250? Does it go to some bigger number well in excess of that? Um, you know, I try not to say like, hey, silver's gonna be 10,000 bucks on the, uh, you know, on the show and I don't know, but it's like also, you know, we're talking about uh, Dr. Skidmore has found $145 trillion of missing money. I don't know if there's really any gold in Fort Knox, so suddenly like when you just look at just take a step back and think what how should gold be priced and not that there's necessarily just one answer but if the whole the there, there was no dollar the dollar came around to say all right so we don't have to send this clunky metal everywhere here this piece of paper is a receipt so it's like ben bernanke doesn't understand gold i mean gold was there before the dollar it's going to be there after the dollar. And if the dollar was just supposed to be gold, do dollars per ounce, it's just a fraction. Um, I have heard one, uh, we'll leave we'll that aside. Um, so it's up to you. I don't know, maybe uh, you could look in Jim Rickard's book if you choose to in the first one in 2011. He had a bunch of scenarios. One was with like a 40% backing. One was with 100% backing. I remember it was in like the tens of thousands. It was like 40,000 or 60,000. Bill Holter calculates, you know, 80 or 90,000. I mean, and some people use the debt. We don't know how many dollars are out there. We don't know how much gold is out there, but, um, you know, those are the different types of things that you can factor in. So if you think, a little bit like this. Let's say you think their Basel three is going to completely end it. Maybe they're ready. Let's maybe or not even if you think that, but let's say you believe. I would say there's somewhere. Oh, good question. What do I think is the probability of something like that happening? Let's say it's just five or ten percent. So let's say five percent. Let's even just to make it like more, uh, you know, in the in the realm of <laughs> reason for. Uh, Folks, we'll say it's a one percent chance that you know they reset the thing. Well, I mean, what do they reset it to? I mean, if they reset it to fifty bucks, that's going to give you one potential payout. If they reset it to five hundred dollars, that's going to give that's going to skew your numbers a lot differently. Because part of what I always thought was cool about options was that you start getting exponential on the curve. Um, I, maybe I won't go too deep into it, but I mean, it's like, it's a derivative and it doesn't go linear. So especially when uh, you get some of these things that are out of the money or you get a big move, that's why now some people do this and I would highly, it's highly illegal and I would, I would not do this and I would not advocate doing it. But when people have inside information on a takeover, before anybody else knows it and they buy those, you know, nickel out of the money calls and the thing soars, you know, somebody gets clobbered. And basically that was a big part of option trading, not being the guy who got clobbered. <laughs> Some guy committed a felony because much like the CFTC, that money usually doesn't come back. Um, so anyway, there are a lot of different ways to approach this. Please, whatever you're doing, think about it first, start small, if you're in position to trade bigger, then you know what you're doing. Go for it and uh, 
Uh, with that said, Rob, did you have any questions on that before you gave us a uh, little thought or two about putting uh, Basel III, what's going down here into English? Yeah, so I'll summarize it. And, and I think there are two opposite ends of the spectrum. I've seen Alistair McLeod think that Basel III and SFR is going to completely shut the LBMA and potentially the COMEX. Uh, he said that on Liberty and Finance. And then I talked to David Morgan on our show uh, last Friday, and he said he did, he had talked to people that were fairly well connected in the London market, and he didn't think it was going to have a huge effect. So I think there's a wide ranging opinion of what could potentially happen with those new Basel requirements. And essentially what it boils down to is this. They're trying to make sure that the banks are more liquid, for example, so they can pass a stress test. And in times of distress that they have the, the right amount of assets that they can get through without basically collapsing. Um, in terms of gold, it affects the London OTC market because you have an unallocated gold position, which um, is on book. And the European Banking Authority said that they would discount it by 85% because they don't, there's not transparency into all the positions. Of course, it's unallocated, so we don't know how much paper is sitting on top of, of the real gold. Lots of studies have been done uh, on this by Ronan Manley as well as others, uh, Braun Cicchecki and uh, many others. And they think that there's not a lot of gold backing that system. So there's wide ranging opinions on what the NSFR is gonna do. The LBMA has put off compliance with this until January 1 of next year. Europe will comply with it on, Jan on uh, June 28th this year, June 28th, June 29th. And in a nutshell, I think at the very least there's gonna be a ton of volatility in the gold price. And I think from six months, July through January, uh, I think we're gonna see big effects in the potential for gold to reach its previous all-time high 2070. I think we could reach it pretty quickly. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of derivative trading going down in the COMEX to, to control that. And if I were a betting man, I would say the gold price goes up pretty high just because of the uncertainty around the situation and what it means. Um, but I have no idea at this point where gold's going to land. I, I honestly don't because everybody that has an opinion on this thinks differently. I haven't found anybody that has a consensus on it. And even the banks, if you read the paper, uh, it, it's very, the way that they laid it out is very, very confusing. It's not straightforward with, with respect to gold. Did you say it was written so that someone wouldn't be able to understand it? <laughs> yes, typical banker talk. They wrote it so that uh, the bankers could basically do whatever they wanted to do. And so whichever way, way it goes, they can nah, cover themselves. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Especially with the transparency of the CCP, keeping it safe for everyone. So uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, and especially on top of that, when we know that we're talking about how are the foxes uh, going to guard the chickens or the hens, Rob? Which, what do foxes try to eat most? Guarding the hen house, I believe. Hen house. Okay, there you go. So again, I mean, I would by all means, if, and this is how I would look at it, or this is how we were trained to look at it on the option floor, you're looking at the different probabilities. So certainly by all means, there's a very significant probability that June 28th comes and they say, ah, well, X, Y, Z, we're not doing it. We're delaying it. We didn't get to it. We decided not to. Um, have you told me they're making they they're they're doing all this stuff just to get people to think they're going to do it and then they're going to ram the price down everyone's throat? That's a possibility too. Um, so anyway, uh, as you can see here, nice uh, free market chart here. <laughs> and Rob, it was interesting. I was listening to uh, Alistair's call again today, and. He was mentioning this whole Basel III thing. Like, I didn't really know the history of it. Uh, he was saying this was designed after the last <laughs> the subprime crisis. This was the plan to make sure there wasn't like too much interbank reliance. And I was like, shit, it's a little late on that one. But yeah. Um, well, there was also an opinion by Hugo, Hugo Salinas Price, the Mexican billionaire, which is apropos since you're down in Mexico. That he and I think he mentioned on the beginning of the call that Russia and China had put pressure on the Western gold system, threatened to back their currencies with gold, and that's why a lot of these requirements came about. So it appears as at the very least, and what I've said on my program is that there's a war for I think control of the gold market is what this is going to end up being. I think they're going to wrest control away from the London market probably 
although we don't know where it's going to go. And I, I think that's where the volatility comes in. So if you're playing options, you can, I guess you can do very well on options trades during high volatility. Well, I mean, it just depends on what volatility level you're paying. I mean, there's always, keep in mind another non-American uh, Wall Street concept of the buying low, selling high. So, you know, that's one of those things that Wall Street really loves conning people into. They say, oh, well, this stock is great. Well, you could have the greatest company ever, but maybe it's worth a billion dollars. If the price is 10 billion a share, that's not a great price to buy it at. Um, similar uh, as we can dig into as well, there's the gold chart here is First Majestic. And for anyone who's seeing an option board for the first time, that's what it looks like. Very exciting. And uh, I'll go slow and uh, Rob, Keep an eye on those questions. If anyone, uh, I want to make this so everyone can understand anything. So, Rob, if you can keep an eye, if anyone has any questions, if something isn't clear, please raise your hand and we will clear that up so that um, you can all understand this as much as possible. So, any question is a good question. Uh, and so, we have one, Chris, now that you mentioned it. And um, right. I don't know the answer, but uh, Wayne asks, uh, he would like to hear your call on debit to call spreads. It seems the decay of buying naked calls for the upward move is what gets everyone. The timing and considering buying out of the money calls, let's say October, and then selling further out of the money calls so that my cost is low, so on and so forth. Hmm. Well, we will get into the calendar spread. Uh, I mean, I agree with what Wayne is saying in certain parts of it. Um, yes, if you do what I did, where you're just buying out of the money calls, be prepared to lose money regularly. Yet, here's the thing. Uh, and I guess I, I veered away from this a little bit in the beginning. You know, I was fortunate. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of hard to say, well, they rigged the price. You know, maybe it would have been that low if it hadn't been rigged. But to some degree, I like to think I got my timing right in 2011. And I was actually, I sold a bunch of my mining stock shares and converted them into options the two weeks before January 29th. And basically I sat the last 10 years hoping that whenever I thought it was gonna go again, I would have a position on to capture that. You know, unfortunately Rossi, Rossi tamped that one down. Although I wonder what, it'd be fun another time to analyze probabilities of a potential legal claim. That would be an interesting pricing exercise. Um, so again, yes, you have that risk. Now, what I balance that with, I mean, if you have, let's say you have any call options on and silver goes to like some insane number, say it gets into the hundreds, Rob, let's say silver hits a hundred bucks. Obviously we're going to have mania in the market, but the day silver hits a hundred bucks, what's your gut reaction? What's the price of first majestic silver? Mm, a whole lot. <laughs> a couple, uh, I don't know, 150 bucks. We were trying to price this the last time we asked this question. All and right. We had ranges anywhere from like 150 to 250 bucks, maybe. So you said 150 first. Let's go yep. first answer, which as uh, the metaphysical, metaphysical gurus often say is what the intuition is telling us before the conditioned mind tries to uh, let Wall Street do their thing. Uh, so let's say... We're looking at now the expiration date. You see, this is AG is the symbol. That's first majestic. And this is July 2nd. Uh, let me take a step back. On the left here, and this is marketchameleon.com. Uh, my good friend, Will McBride built this site uh, and I like using it. Um, you can see the expirations. So it's think of it like an insurance policy and you can buy different lengths and actually, I'm sorry, to finish Wayne's question, it, it all depends um, when you said about the decaying call options, because if, so, if First Majestic, and this is what we'll go into in a second, but you could sit there, like I've mapped these out where depending on the pricing at the time, you could put this on for 20 years. And if silver hit 50 bucks anytime in the next 20 years and you were able to maintain that pricing, you would still come out ahead um, because you know if you have $150 silver or first majestic, as you'll see, we'll go through the example here. We'll see you get such a massive return 
Now, if these were being priced, if there were other people in the market that were expecting a big move, then your odds, your implied odds come down, very similar to poker. Um, so, you know, again, it all comes down to what your expectations are. Um, Wayne, with the call spreads, partly I have an aversion to them because, you know, my background is as a market maker and the call spreads were like always the trades we were the most happy to take the other sides of because there's already a hedged risk. And plus, you know, people would always overpay for, from the market maker standpoint, where if we're flipping stuff back and forth all the time, I don't care if I'm wrong 20, 30, 40, I don't even care if I'm wrong 55 out of a hundred times. If I'm getting compensated enough, let's say we have, uh, you know, an even coin, so it's 50, 50 heads or tails, um, but let's say Rob's giving me a hundred to one odds. If I win twice, and I'm probably gonna win somewhere around 50 times, I don't need, the goal isn't, I mean, I don't care about how many times I win. I mean, Rob, would you be okay if you placed a hundred trades and you lost a million dollars on 99 of them, but you made a trillion on uh, the hundred. Absolutely. So we want to keep in mind uh, that's a key point, maximizing the total gain. It doesn't matter the win rate. In fact, the guy who trained me, I remember at one point early on, he said, pretty sure it was 53% that if I was winning on more than 53% of my trades, I was not trading optimally. That makes sense. Uh, and if any, anyone has a question, but essentially, now there's different ways you can approach it. That's from a market maker standpoint, where it's essentially, it's like if I'm the casino or the bookmaker or the blackjack table, and you know you don't need a huge edge, but the math is in your favor. So I guess the other thing with the call spreads, actually, I guess I'm describing the verticals as opposed to a calendar spread. And let me clear up what the difference is. And I guess he was asking about the calendar spread. So I'll answer that one in a second as well. But a vertical would be sometimes people will buy the 21 strike and sell the 22 strike. So you're going to pay less for that, but you're capping your upside. So similar with the uh, calendars, that would be buying one month and selling another, which we will get to in this call, um, because that was actually one of the things I thought was interesting. And I've been thinking about in regards to Basil. Um, so Wayne, hopefully that helped a little bit. And uh, if you have any other questions, uh, let me go through a bit more. And uh, then if the question still remains, we can get you on there and cover that up. So let's go back here. You see here are the different months. These that or this first majestic has weeklies. So they have a set of options expiring June 11th, June 18th, June 25th. Basil date ends up being June 28th. Again, of course, the date can change. So, you know, that's why maybe you think they're going to delay it a week and you'd say, well, yeah, I don't want to buy July. I think for some reason you decide, you know, I think they're going to, instead of June 28th, they're going to, go out drinking and forget to show up and it's going to take them a couple extra days. So then you could look at July 9th and we will get into the calendars, how essentially if you bought the July 9th, you have an option policy insurance policy. If we looked at it like that, that expires then and maybe you only wanted to have it on for that. Maybe you're thinking, I think there's, Let's stick with the June 28th date. Let's say we think it's whatever they decide they're going to do on that date. So I'd want to be covered on June 28th. So I can buy the July, these ones that expire in July too. Say I buy the, we'll look at the 30 strike. So if I wanted rather than paying, see, if I just buy July, I'm paying for a whole month. But what if you just wanted that week? That's where, uh, and actually, I think that 
Now, maybe why I got confused with Wayne, I didn't read Rob, did he say he was wanted to buy the later month or sell the later month? Uh, let me scroll back up here. It says, um, it seems the decay of buying naked calls for the upward move is what gets everyone considering buying out of the month calls, let's say October, and then selling further out of the month calls so that my cost is low. Uh, he can buy a plethora of contracts as long as it moves up, not necessarily even in my strike. I'm making money. Thoughts? Well, my thought there is that I think it would make sense if he was doing the other half of that trade, um, because if you're buying the near month and selling the longer month. So we look here, the July 30 strike, this bid is six cents, the offer is 17. We'll call it a dime to make the math nice and easy on that one. Um, so if this is July 2nd expiration, the 30 strike, because of the way options are set up, where I don't wanna get too technical tonight and probably uh, have a little uh, review to do on this, but a later dated option. So July 2nd is going to have to be less. Sometimes they could be equal, but August 2nd is going to have to trade over July 2nd. Because if August traded underneath, it's, you can't like a two month insurance policy is gonna have to cost more than a one month insurance policy, right? Even Rob, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Let's say you wanted yes. insurance from now until next month, and it costs a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. Even if, you know, from next month to the following month, month two, for whatever reason, there was no value because of whatever the parameters of what you're looking at, it could be worth zero, which would mean that that spread would be zero. But the back month, because it contains the front month, has to be inclusive of that. So Rob, uh, I'm sure there, I'm guessing there is, I'm maybe not sure, but guessing there may be a question. Let me know if I need to explain that again. Uh, please, if anyone is not clear on that, I do have a Google doc up here. There so was, if you have any question on that or need that explained again. There was, I think that's a good explanation. There was a follow-up comment by Wayne. He said, same month, October, buy 31, sell 35 as an example. So that would be a vertical. So if we look in October, And Wayne, uh, actually, can Rob, can you get Wayne on here so uh, he can uh, get right into the questions even better than me uh, talking about theoretical stuff doesn't do anybody much. Good. Yeah, Wayne, uh, if you can, if you're still listening, I see you here, if you'll unmute. Hi, Chris. Hello. I've never played, I've never played the, the debit spread, but I've seen some people talking about that's how they're, that's how they're mitigating their exposure on their naked uh, they're naked out of the money calls by playing the spreads. And, and since it's consistently moving up, it's just not moving up in large increments and it's not moving fast, that they're consistently making money doing that. And I just wanted to see your thoughts. Well, if they're talking about that buy right or the covered call, I'm gonna be careful how I phrase this. I'm not saying, well, actually there's, I could even make the uh, mathematical article uh, argument I mean, usually it's, it's hard for that to be the best trade, even if the parameters of that trade, because a covered call is synthetically a put. Uh, I'm not gonna go into mapping out the uh, particulars of that, but I mean, I have yet to see, again, I was on the other side as a market maker, and I'm not saying there aren't situations where that strategy isn't right, although, even if that view were correct to capture that, what someone's opinion was, usually you're overpaying by doing the covered call. And what these covered calls, what they don't mention is let's say First Majestic goes to 50 bucks, you're capping your upside there. Now, if you're willing to do that, then, you know, I, we uh, could discuss how Maybe at the end we'll we'll go into that how it's similar to when you're do, when you're buying stock and selling the call, you are. We'll save put call parity for a future date, but really the way we looked at it, you're buying the strike, because if I buy a call, 
And actually, this would be a good thing to map out at home. I'll tell you what, map it out at home, and I'll go through this. I'll show the, I'll have some diagrams ready on the next one. But map it out at home and all this stuff. Don't worry if you get the right answer. But it's like I could tell, I could sit here and map it out, and everyone could follow and nod their head. But just go through the, the, the practice of look at what's the payoff of a call option. Well, if it's flat, you know, when you pay a premium, if it goes below that, you lose your premium. But if it goes up, then it starts going like this. We won't get into the diagrams, but map out what is your payoff diagram. You can find these online. Because if you own a call, but if I do an offsetting stock hedge, one-to-one -one for each call I sell a share of stock, that has synthetically converted it into a put position. And again, go through it at home. Even if you can't get it, if you at least try, your mind will be more able to understand it when we go through it the next time. And I will be happy to do that because it's actually really interesting and really relevant. Although uh, I'm going to save that for tonight. But the point is, is that there's a mathematical level. So it's like if I really wanted these calls, but I see synthetically, I can buy the put at a cheaper level and convert it with a stock hedge. Um, so back to what you were saying, the thing is, is that usually people are overpaying or, or people are writing covered calls, at least as I've seen it. And I'm not saying there aren't newsletter writers out there that perhaps have good strategies, although generally, this is just from my perspective, the stuff that I see written in these columns, I've even heard things from people that you know that perhaps are even in my book that say things that were how we funded the cafeteria and the bonus pool at Susquehanna. So um, with the, the other thing is with the covered call, Let's say even that you decided you wanted to, I think the people, the reason people do it is they feel they're collecting income, which on one hand is true. And I could see that argument for, you know, selling options. I mean, sure, especially if you think the price of an option is overvalued, there's a great time to sell options, or there's great times to be short things. Again, now that is definitely for most people is not probably suitable to be shorting options. I don't even have that set up in my account right now um, because then, you know, if someone's sitting there shorting first majestic call options, part of my biggest worry is that if I, like, let's say I, I have these July uh, 30 calls on for 10 cents. And Basil did go through and First Majestic is $150 stock. My real worry is, am I going to get paid out? Are these guys going to be like, uh, sorry, but we're screwing you because of this ridiculous reason, even though you told us before what would happen. Um, so uh, what's it? Yes, yeah, so I guess the last thing I wanted to say to Wayne, and then you can let me know, Wayne, if you had a follow-up question that if you own a share of stock, let's say you own your first Majestic and what's the price of first Majestic here today? 17 bucks. So if you own your share and you sell the 20 strike call, the bid right there is 38 cents. So let's say you whack that guy's bid. If, you know, if it finishes anywhere, 17, 18, $19, even up to $20 and 38 cents would be your break even. Yeah, you'd come out ahead, but here's the thing. If you have that, if you've sold that call the day that the COMEX does collapse and First Majestic goes to 150, I mean, you made like, you know, a couple, or you, you made like a little bit, but you lose out on that big move, which is okay. It all depends on what you're trying to target. Again, I'm not saying everybody should target what I'm trying to target. And maybe I'll be right, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But to me, what I'm targeting is the bigger move. Not that everybody has to target that, but the difference is that if you are targeting that and you sell that call, you're capping your upside. <laughs> so imagine if we boil the last 10 minute speech down to, when you do the covered call, you're capping your upside. So if you want those like returns like they got in the big short, 
where you and you know that I've mapped out in some of the previous option videos, you have to be okay with losing many times. Now, had I sold, and I'll put it, I'll, let me put this in context. Uh, I'm not saying this just otherwise, I think the numbers and this will put it, make it easier to understand. Cause I still remember when I first started on the option floor and I was clerking for some of the guys, it was like my first day and I'm watching the guys P and L cause it's always up on a screen and he's always looking. I mean, you know, you like market opens, thing says up $200,000 and it's like ticking by the seconds, 200,000. 178, you know, 20,000, 350. And I'm like sitting there, I'm like, oh my God, this money is fluctuating this quickly. Um, now, again, you don't have to, You, I would imagine most people won't be taking positions anywhere near that size. Maybe some people will. But to put that in context, I had an account with about $27,000 in it in uh, January of this year. I think I recorded this actually, I've been looking for it. It'd be fun to uh, dig into it. But I think by before the whole game stop into 27th into the 29th of January, I think before like the silver squeeze weekend, I might've ended up with convert, like had about of the 27,000, I think 10,000 was in shares and 17,000 was in options, which were pretty far out of the money because I bought the cheap ones. And I think the high point I remember seeing on, uh, I guess it must've been the first, it had gone from 27,000 to 195,000. And that was, you know, when things were just over 30 and really the sweet spot when you, like if you have, I think I had stuff like the 23, 24, 25 strike in First Majestic. When you buy those out of the money options, you know, First Majestic, if you bought those and First Majestic opens Monday, 25 bucks, you're going to do really well. But when it blows through that strike, so put in other words, let's say you thought First Majestic was going to go to $25 at whatever time period. If that's where you thought it was going to go, you know, maybe I'd want like the 22 line or the 21 line because the way options work, we'll get perhaps more into the math a little deeper on this another time. But when you blow through the strike, that's when they really start picking up steam. So again, my thing had gone up 8x and that was just kind of when it got to the strike. Now, I didn't sell it and the thing ended up basically being worthless and I was okay with that. You know, uh, or it didn't go worthless. Then I put it on a couple more times over the past few months until it did go worthless. Um, but again, also keep in mind, I've designed a lot of my life around being able to make that bet. And I waited 10 years and I was thinking about it. I don't know what you would value it at, but I mean, there's some, maybe you say I have a 5% chance of getting a claim or we either the class action suit or whatever it may be, who knows, but there's some, and that's the kind of science there's, there's some probability of that, but um, more importantly, if from a move of silver from 27 to 30, and a lot of my bet was on first majestic, there was other stuff mixed in, but let's say it hadn't been tamped down Let's say silver had gone to 35 or 40 bucks that day. Rob, what do you think? Uh, if I think First Majestic got up to uh, about $25. Uh -huh. I think I saw it somewhere over 25 bucks. This chart, I think intraday it got on the first, it got as high. Uh, I don't know how to do the intraday chart there, but um, let's say silver had gone up. Let's say silver went from 27 to 30. And First Majestic went from uh, basically 14 bucks to 25. So a $3 move in silver was a 10 or 11, let's call it a $10 move in First Majestic. And yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be leverage. So you're going to, for every dollar that silver price moves up, you should get a multiple on the First Majestic price. Yeah. And there you did. You got a $3 rise in silver and you got a $10, $11 rise in First Majestic. 
Now, here's the thing is partly why I'm willing to take that risk and put it on and I will do it again. In fact, I've, you know, I'm, we're, this is why we're having this call and I'll describe what I'm looking at. Um, I also, and Rob, we did a call shortly before that, how there was a, a short position on First Majestic 2. So, I mean, it's like you have like 8 million kinds of leverage stacked on this thing. You could make the case that like if silver went to 35 bucks, that, you know, or let's say silver went from 27 to 30, a $3 move, First Majestic move 10. You know, this is guessing, but maybe when silver goes from 30 to 33, people blow through the first majestic shorts maybe silver goes or first majestic goes up 20 on the next three dollar move of course it could go up less but what i'm getting at is that since the options i had were let's get our board back here we hadn't really gone through the sweet spot but let's say silver had gone to 35 or 40 bucks Instead of like on the first $3 getting an eight to one return, you pick up leverage on that. So the next three bucks could have been much higher than that. It could be lower than that. Again, we're talking with a lot of variables. And I would suggest to people, keep in mind, you know, I think it's great to have your favorite mining stocks. For the most part, I just look for people who know what they're doing, have good assets. Because this stuff is going to be priced by generalists. People are just like flooding. You're going to have billions of dollars once it finally moves, trying to flood in. I don't think people are going to be like, well, you know, First Majestic, you know, their last, uh, you know, drill results and, you know, their production numbers was, you know, 10 basis points uh, better than this one. And I mean, you're just going to have people like, I think there'll be a premium because people know what First Majestic is. I mean, there's Rob, you've seen this. There's tons of small companies that are great companies, but, you know, is the guy that just is watching CNBC say like, holy shit, silver just hit 35 bucks. Now it's hitting 45 bucks. Or, or I mean, if they do a Basel reset and we wake up next month and silver's, let's even forget the big numbers. So it goes to like $50. And we, uh, we got a little background noise there. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of different things that can happen, but what I'm trying to point out and perhaps long, very long answer to Wayne's question, I don't know. I mean, I, now I don't put everything I have into this, you know, and I put an amount based on what is appropriate. You know, I've maybe I have a different income stream I create again, you really need, that's where you need to take your own situation, talk with people you trust or licensed people, because I don't know everybody's situation yet. Let's say, you know, I, let's say I do the same thing again, and I happen to have it on, or actually better yet, I don't have to do uh, theoreticals. Let's say, uh, <laughs> let's say Rosti can't tamp down Vladimir Putin. Let's say Hugo Salinas price is right. <laughs> and the CFTC doesn't tamp this one down. And we get Rob's number. Let's let's say we have uh, they reset silver to a hundred bucks. Whether it's, I guess. Uh, side note there. Part of why I think it's possible is that let's say they're out of metal, and they're at the point where they simply have to reset it. Similar to how the London Gold Pool unraveled, and they kind of had a de facto reset. Whatever the parameters are. Is it possible to me that they could be at that point in Basel three, whatever the legal jargon they use is essentially the reset. I think that's at least possible. And we can take questions about how you might look at a weighted average of that. Maybe say there's 5% chance it happens. Let's say there's i uh, I'll make the numbers easy. Rob, does it sound reasonable? Let's say there's a 10% chance Basel three goes through and silver gets reset to $100 and a 90% chance nothing happens and silver gets stamped down again. Is that at least in the ballpark? Yeah, and I think you still win in that case. So, sure. So let's say we take uh, $100 and we make this bet. So 90% of the time you're gonna lose, right? You lose, you lose all your premium, at least in this scenario. So uh, you have, well, Jesus, it's been a long time since I did one. So 90% of the time, you're going to end up with zero. Okay. 
but 10% of the time we're going to end up with something. So in this example, we'll say they reset it to 100 um, based on my own studies, research, pondering, and interesting conversations that pop out of the sky from time to time. But this is it. When they finally do reset this, <laughs> it ain't going to be anywhere near 100 bucks. But we'll keep uh, people on the reservation here. Let's say that you know they reset it to $100. There's a 10% chance of that. 90% chance you lose all your money. Uh, Rob, can you see, is everybody clear on that? I'll repeat that again. In fact, I'll do you one better. I will put it here so we can, uh, so 10% chance of reset that includes $50 silver, uh, well, silver on June, 28 and 90% chance the bullion banks hammer it good. It good, knit good. Um, and calls, calls expire worthless. Rob, can you let me know if that makes sense to you and simultaneously see if we have any questions just if this makes uh, sense for the parameters of our example here. Everybody good on that? And if there's any part, there's no question that uh, we can not answer. Uh, so please uh, let me know if they need to explain it again. Looking good. All right, Rob, did that make sense to you then I'm assuming since you did not raise your hand? Yep, it made sense. All right, so, and Rob, uh, or no, we said, uh, I'm sorry, look at my, <laughs> We did agree on $100 silver at the reset, right? We did. And then we further said, or you suggested that if we had $100 silver, $150 uh, first Majestic. Yeah? Yes. So, that was my call. Again, more important, don't, like, if you're sitting there saying, this guy's nuts, we're never going to see $150, then... Just look at how the math is done and later you can put in whatever number you think it is um, and we can leave that as maybe in questions and we can discuss that more. But again, what's more important here is just so you see how you can start approaching these. And actually, you know, maybe something that could be a good starting point. You know, if you have assets or, you know, if you have like $200,000 of silver, and you take 2000 bucks, put it in an option account and trade one lots. So you're, you, whatever is an appropriate amount for you, even if it's a hundred dollars, the process of just actually interacting, trading, get opening a brokerage account. It's like a lot of people like, you know, sit there and read about playing the guitar for years and they're like, oh, this uh, diatonic scale is great. And like, I wonder which would go better with uh, this heavy metal sound, that or a flamenco riff, but they, they don't even own a guitar. You got to like interact with it. There's the, the learning is great and it's a great part, but find a way uh, or even better yet paper trade, but keep track of it. You'll learn so much more if you combine that with, you know, again, you can listen to the option stuff I've done. There's other good stuff out there. Um, but really uh, that's another key getting some way that you're get to feel it. Cause it's just different. It's different when you even, like, even if you paper traded, but wrote accurate notes and actually reviewed like, okay, the stock went here, maybe I'd sell my call here. And this is how much I would have made if you can do it even, you know, small amounts, like a one lot, you know, and um, that way, because I do believe subconsciously when there's money, even if it's not a lot, when you have money, then all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, I, I don't want to lose my money. It, forces your mind to make the decisions and incorporate the information. And especially if you start, if you just took a hundred dollars, some amount that you give yourself the freedom, you know what, hey, I was gonna go to the blackjack table, but I'm gonna just try this option thing. And if you give yourself the freedom to not need to succeed on the first time, just say, all right, I'm gonna, I'm just, I'm gonna use $100 as education, just play around with it, see what happens. 
that would be infinitely better than just about anything else I could certainly think of because I just feel there's so much value to when you actually, you know, on some level get started doing it, you start learning more. Um, and if you give yourself the freedom to not need to be right, right away, uh, also helps a lot. So <laughs> disclaimer aside, Rob, does it sound good to go? And we'll dig back into our probabilities now that we have the, uh, the fatherly advice on the matter. Uh, I'm good. All right. So let's go back to our option board, which is here. So 90% of the time we got zero, but here's the key question. Let's say they do hit it and we're gonna buy this. We'll say we could put, probably wouldn't get filled at a dime here, but on this 30 strike, expiring July 2nd and 18 trading days, six cents is the bid, 17 cents is the offer, which means if the market were open right now and these were running in real time, you could electronically pay 17 cents it's being currently offered there. You have a trade and you're good to go. Similarly, you could hit the bid. You could sell at six cents. Well, one thing I'd like to point out is let's say I was wanted to buy these. I wouldn't start out by paying 17 cents because actually, and I was on the other side of this, especially uh, actually got quite nifty towards the end. Like if we would have all sorts of parameters. So let's say, Let's say I think this, my model says this option is worth a dime and I have an elect, what it was called an electronic eye, which was willing to step up for three cents of edge is what we, edge of a trade, which means if my model thinks it's a dime and someone puts a 13 cent bid in, that would be three cents of edge. They're paying three cents more than my theoretical value. I could set my thing so I wouldn't even see it my screen would say, all right, I'm at 17 cents. Somebody puts 13 cents or better, it better. It automatically would sell that. So here there's a good chance. If you put in a 16 cent bid, you'll get filled and there's no risk to trying it. Hey, put in a 16 cent bid. If it just sits there and nothing happens, you can always change it and pay 17, but you don't have to pay the screens. Now here where it's 24 at 27, that's, some of these markets get pretty tight. You know, here this one's 38 is the bid, 40 is the offer. So, you know, and here his model, you know, someone could set it, you know, for one cent of edge. And if you offered it 39 cent there, I would step up and take it. Um, but the key takeaway there, especially when you see them wider here, try putting in a 15 cent bid or a 14 cent bid or 16 cent bid or whatever the market is. Keep in mind, you don't have to pay the screen and sometimes you'll get filled better. And while it might sound like, you know, 10 cents or 15 cents, it's a nickel, what's the difference? Well, that's 50%. So, I mean, you'll see, and we'll go through the math when you, if you paid a dime versus a nickel and this thing went to $150, even if you put a thousand bucks in there, you're talking about a massive difference in money. So, you know, sometimes you have to pay what you have to pay, but especially trading, it's an ongoing thing. Even when you have a situation where there's like a big move, if it's something you're going to be ongoing, you just let that math sort itself out. And anytime, if you can regularly save 10% on a trade multiple times, that compounds and adds up. So you do what you have to do, but whenever there are times where you can get some, the same exact thing for a lower price, certainly you want to take advantage of that. Now here, just to make math simple, let's say that I could put a 10 cent bid in here and get filled. So I'd be paying 10 cents for the uh, July 2nd, 30 strike is how that would be phrased. Everybody good on that so far? Rob, let me know if we have questions, but otherwise I'll keep going. So I've paid 10 cents for the option to pay $30 for First Majestic at any point before July 2nd in a couple of weeks. 
So let's say nothing happens. And, you know, let's, let's say just sat there between 17 and 18 bucks until July 2nd. Now I would like a volunteer on this one. So someone who has not yet spoken uh, wants to step up to the plate and take this one. If silver or first majestic stays between 17 and 18 bucks until July 2nd, would you want to exercise your option and which gives you the right to pay $30 for first majestic. And actually I will say bonus points. If somebody actually doesn't know the answer, but is going to be courageous enough to just jump into the pool and say, uh, try and I'll guide you through it. Um, so Rob, can you pick someone uh, who is ready to become uh, option legend just by uh, getting in the game here? Uh, I think Scott had a question earlier. Scott, do you want to jump on with us? Uh, I was going to make the educated guess that you want to sell before the option expiry instead of exercising the option. Say that again, please, Scott. I, I, I would guess that you want to sell your, uh, your options before hitting the expiry instead of exercising them. Like exercise them, exercising options carries like, uh, like additional margin requirements and whatnot. Right. Like, I, I mean, that's a factor I assume might not be directly related. Um, not in equity options or I mean, I guess you could be trading them on margin. I've never traded anything on margin uh, to be clear about that. And I would be very hesitant to do so. And I would certainly never recommend <laughs> someone to do that, especially in the silver market. Um, now, yes, you are correct. You could sell it. But well, let's say with that we be so here's the thing what do you know how do you know when to sell it i mean what if you sell it you're like i mean by the time july 2nd comes you know the thing's expired so you can sell it but then you don't have your insurance policy on but let's say we took that that leave that aside for a second if we can sell it but just specifically Scott, if First Majestic stayed at $17 for the next 18 trading days and you owned the 30 strike call, would you exercise the option to pay $30 for a share of First Majestic when it is trading at $17? No, I misunderstood your question. I was, so no, the answer would then be no. Right, right. You would, because you have that option, but. <clears throat> You know, it's, it would be considered out of the money if the thing stays at 17 bucks. Well, if you really want to buy the shares, you'll just go out and pay 17 on the open market. You wouldn't want to pay $30 because why pay $30 if things on sale for 17? Does that make sense? Okay, so A, let's give a big round of applause to Scott. Thank you for jumping in there and anybody else who's clapping along at home. And that's not sarcastic applause. I do mean that. Thank you for uh, answering that. It will uh, click in your brain in a deeper subconscious level now, which is great. Um, now, Scott, if you want to play in the game or Rob, you could pick on someone else, not pick on, you could choose someone else. <laughs> so let's say that just to make this fun, we'll do this in steps. Rob, you can give someone else a shot. So thank you again, Scott, appreciate that. And you were quite correct. And, uh, but let's say uh, before getting to the $150 outcome, let's say, you know, Basil three, you know, uh, maybe Jeff Christian makes a new video or whatever. And for <laughs> Majestic, let's say Ross can't tamp it down at 30 bucks and first Majestic for whatever reason ends up at $50 by this july 2nd expiration we'll forget about early exercise or any or selling it early uh, which yes are options but we will leave those aside for now so who would like to take who would like to come on next and say and walk through our calculations which are actually a lot easier than you would imagine i'll be here to help but uh rob do we have someone on do we have a caller on the line i think alex was asking a question alex do you want to jump in here Feel free. Me? Hey, Alex. Alex. Hey. How are you? Uh, I'm 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 doing great, man. Um, I know I didn't have I didn't have any questions. I just I 
commented in the comments that I got I got exercised when I went on a little vacation in March on some SLV calls. It was really annoying because the feed Were you shorting stuff. SLV calls, Alex. No, 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 no. I was long. I was long the calls. Oh, and then they gave you I like a, oh, and they gave you kind I of. Got like, I went on vacation. I forgot to sell them. I fell asleep in the back seat of a suburban. <laughs> well. Well, you probably would have gotten a couple extra basis points on the whole deal. Um, usually what happens is that they will, like if they're deep into money, you'll, they'll get exercised and you'll be long the stock. You know, it'll say like, hey, can you deposit another $10,000? Or, but you can just sell the shares. So um, now if you're able to sell the call and capture an extra nickel or a dime uh, before the close at some point can be good. Um, so yes. And, uh, the best part, you got the experience of seeing, oh, okay. If I go away and I had the position and it's in the money, now you have an extra data point. So again, just by playing around and trying it, you're going to learn, which is a good thing, but well, I was really, what's I was, that? I was really happy and, uh, you know, laughed about it because it was, it was like a, it was like a hundred dollars or less in like fees because it was in the money. And so, you know, it was, it was a very cheap learning experience. Don't forget about this. Yeah, well, better to learn it than when you're, uh, you know, successful solar industry uh, executive leader and, you know, putting a hundred million dollars on it because everybody else on the planet doesn't know what to do and you do because you got in the game early. So Alex, may I ask you, let's say that you paid a dime for your 30 strike calls and it's finally our lucky day and we're looking at $50 first majestic silver. So the price of the first majestic silver is now 50 bucks. And you have, if you even forget what you paid for it, we'll come back to that. But you have a option that gives you the opportunity to pay $30 for a stock that is trading on the open market at $50. What are you going to do? Would you exercise that option or would you, I would I would look at I would look at what people are, are bidding. I would look and see what the options were if I sold. Would you pay thirty dollars for, for the stock that's trading at fifty? If you're twenty dollars in the money, as they say. Yes. I'll answer that one. I would say yes. Rob says yes. Alex, what do you think? Or what's the question probably, if you're not even sure what to think? What walk me through what so, you're thinking? My thing is that I probably at thirty dollars, I probably wouldn't have the the capital to exercise any. No, because if you exercise this for thirty dollars, you can simultaneously sell it at fifty. Because in our example, the stock is now trading fifty. Let's say we were doing it simultaneously. We're not, forget about capital or anything. Just let's say that's taken care of. What I'm getting at is when the stock is trading $50. So if you can exercise these because you have the right, you have the option to pay $30 for a stock. Would you do that if you can simultaneously you exercise it, you're holding the stock and you sell it at 50 capturing $20? Well, sure. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Well, obviously. Yeah. It's 20 bucks to me. Yeah. I wasn't trying to it's make it like 100. a trick curve yeah. question. It would be deep in the money. So of yeah. course you'd be happy. Now here's the fun part, Alex. So now we said we paid a dime for these 10 cents, right? Yes. So you paid 10 cents for something that's worth 20 bucks, right? Yes. So what's your uh, multiple return? I don't know. Might have buy a dime. Two thousand? No, two. I don't think so. Close. If it's a dime, you got ten, and then ten. It's a hundred. You got a hundred fold, right? Uh, well, if it's twenty cents or twenty dollars. And you're moving the desk if you paid a dime, so 20 over divided by 0.1, 
you're moving the decimal place one point you're very close to it you're that you're it's coming it's ready to come out i believe well, it's, it's 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 two thousand dollars right minus your cost which would be ten dollars ten cents times a hundred right well let's take a step back just if you have something worth twenty dollars and you paid 10 cents for it, what is your multiple return? You are, well, you have, uh, or you're just off by a decimal. You're very close. 20,000? 20, 20 divided by 0. 0.1. 20,000. No. 200. Yes. There, we go. there you go. Yeah, <laughs> you're going to type that in. What's that? You got it. Okay. You got the answer. So you have 200 X. Right. Tenth. So in that scenario, you're getting a 200 to one return. So to what Wayne said earlier, yeah, you know, if you put this on, you could basically put this on this trade on for 200 months. And if you hit it once, you break even. If you get lucky and you hit it after 100 months, then you come out, you've doubled your money. If you get really lucky and you time it specifically, and that's kind of the, I guess, bringing it back to the whole Basel III thing. I don't know what the probability is that um, they do it, but I'm willing to pay a dime. So let's say I, I, I put a 1000 bucks on that. And let's say I hit it. And I get 200 to one, what's, if I put a thousand dollars and I get 200 to one multiple, how much does my thousand dollars become? Oh, oh you're uh, 200,000. Right. Yeah. So if I made 200 individual $1,000 bets, so 200 months would be, uh, Let's see, uh, 12 times eight is 96. So uh, be about, let's say eight and uh, 16 and two thirds years. Rob, is my math correct there? I think so. How many years? Uh, 16 uh, two, and two thirds, is that right? 200 months is how many years? 200 divided by 12. Yeah, 16, six, six. Okay. <laughs> So basically at that pricing and at first majestic in that scenario goes to $50, I could put that trade on for 16 and two thirds years. And if I hit it anywhere before then it'd be breaking even. So if you hit it in year two, it's going to look really good. <laughs> if you, and again, you can adjust any of the parameters you want. Maybe you think it goes now. All right. Uh, Alex, thank you. Brilliantly done. And now you're, uh, you have even more experience. So everybody let's give a round for Alex. Thank you. Just winning by participating. Um, Rob, who, uh, I'm going to give you a fun one. Let's, uh, we'll do two more of these and then just take some questions. I think we're getting to the point here. Rob, auditor, Rob, let's say before we get to $150 silver, Let's say, you know, I mean, we did, I mean, you said it, not me. <laughs> you said 150, but we'll just take $100. So Rob, you know, Basel three, we get 10% chance comes and, uh, you know, big move. Silver price gets reset to hundred bucks. First Majestic's at a hundred dollars and you've paid a dime for these 30 strike calls. Now I, I helped Alex a little bit. Now that you've seen that, can you walk me through the math of what those, the same calculations I did? Let me know if you need help, but uh, are you comfortable seeing if you can take it on your own at least to get started? So a hundred bucks and you paid 10 cents for what was it, the 30? 30 strike, you paid 10 cents and the underlying price. And again, we're not gonna talk about early exercise. We'll just assume we're holding it to expiration and the stock is a hundred dollars. You own the 30 strike and you paid 10 cents. So you're clearing 70 on the trade, right? Yeah. Is it 70 divided by the 10 cents? Yep. Which would equal 700. 
And if you put a thousand dollars on that, that means you would end up with what? 700,000. So now that means <laughs> you could do that for 700 months. And uh, let's see. Uh, all right, 700 months is how many years? So who will be the first one to get that right in the chat? Well, I'm going to attempt to calculate in my head, see if my mock math is still good. So 700 months is how many years? Fifty-eight point three three. Fifty-eight and a third. Yes, you got it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, still got it. We had to go through uh, in mock trading. Uh, you know, it's quite an exercise. We had to go through all sorts of you know, like calendar spreads and all. Partly, you know, I just figured uh, stop writing it down. Just learned to memorize it, and uh, you know the uh, things we spend our time doing. So, what do we come up with? Fifty-eight and a third years. Right. I mean, would you say there's a chance, like by 58 years from now, <laughs> you think silver is going to be more or less than a hundred dollars? Um, so keep in mind, you know, there's all sorts of things like, are we buying one policy? Are we buying many rolling it over? We won't get into all that tonight. As you can see, uh, perhaps maybe another worthwhile thing to mention not just option trading, but anything, you know, like don't, <laughs> I've, uh, I've, uh, I'll say I've gotten better at learning things when I let go of the thinking, like I have to know it tonight. I mean, it's like poker. You can always more, you can learn playing an instrument. There's just, you know, let the basics sink in and there's not any like finish line here, but just seeing some of these probabilities and how the things map out. And so actually, can we get Wayne back on for a second? Wayne, are you there? Yes, I'm here. So Wayne has that, not to say that my way about going it is right or that my parameters are right, but has that at least addressed a bit more your question of why, at least if one was saying, you know, if I'm thinking about buying out of the money calls, is that putting in perspective the risk profile that you're looking at and why at least I would consider it. Oh, certainly. Yeah. If, if, if someone's going down the path of what I suggested earlier, you're severely capping what your payoff would be. Yeah. Um, if you sell that call on that, you know, depending on, uh, I don't, I'm a little lazy to map out the math on that tonight, but like you get how you're, you're losing that, huge it's like almost like you can buy lotto tickets and something where the odds are stacked in your favor favor either everything i've been saying everybody having the show is wrong or whenever that day happens plus i mean what if it gets reset to something a lot higher so again i'm not trying to say what is the way it's going to happen or that my guess is better than anybody else's guess but Wayne does at least now you're seeing the framework, how you can take and insert any parameters and at least understand what you're comparing and how you're calculating and can take this on any option board and see it for yourself. Does that make sense now? Yes. Well, great. Um, so don't go too far. We'll take actually Wayne, would you like to do the $150 scenario here? Does Wayne not want to do the hundred fifty dollars? Oh. So, so you're saying, what are you saying about in at ten dollars a contract, and we've gone to a hundred and fifty, and the strike was thirty? Um, let's say ten cents per contract, just to keep the numbers consistent. Although technically you are correct because each contract represents a hundred shares. So, if you pay a dime for one contract, you're actually going to pay ten dollars. But just, I like looking at it this way because then it makes the math a bit simple. Does that sound okay? Sure. sure. So let's say we paid a dime for these calls. In this scenario, you have $150 first Majestic Silver. Can you walk us through same calculations um, Alex and Rob did? 
Um, let me know if you need help, but just try and go as far as you can and see if you can get what our math would look like on that. First Majestic is $150 now. You own the 30 strike call and you paid 10 cents for it. You still there, Wayne? I'm here. <laughs> so if you're just thinking, that's cool. Take your time, no rush. Think out loud if you can. That could be helpful to you as well as others. Uh, but whatever you feel comfortable with, I appreciate you participating. Well, I'm I'm doing the multiples in my head. I'm doing the multiples by a hundred. So I'm thinking I paid ten dollars for it, and it's worth twelve thousand a, a contract right now. Okay, you can and actually fine. Let's let's do it that way, and we'll check both ways. Uh, make sure we get the same math. That's actually a great idea, um, and I, I appreciate you bring that up because, you know, especially when you have a lot of numbers flying around quickly, uh, knowing how to do two different ways and check and make sure you get the same answer, you know, can be a handy thing. So walk us through uh, your calculation. All right. And how many of these did I purchase to begin with? Just one contract? Let's just say one to keep it simple. Okay. So I'm up. Uh, if, if I execute at 30, then I'm paying um, 3,000 to execute. And I was 10 into it to begin with. So I'm 3,010 into it. And I'm turning around and selling it uh, for 15,000 for a $11,990 profit, correct? What is your profit number again? 11,990. 11,990, okay. I think you're making, well, I mean, I, I, I think what you're doing is correct. It seems like a harder way to do it, but let's uh but continue so you have 11,990 and you paid so what would be your multiple return <laughs> uh see why it gets a little more confusing that way yeah as opposed to I'll tell you what, and you, here's the best thing. Try it the way we were doing it. And then you can also like go like load up a spreadsheet, you know, where the numbers do it for you. And I would, in fact, I would highly recommend if anyone get an Excel spreadsheet or a Google spreadsheet. Yeah, I have a spreadsheet I can send people and maybe we'll find the link for that or Yara, you can actually, no, I don't want to post that there. Build if you go through the process of just typing these things in, that's how you can really learn. But uh, so, I mean, we can leave that aside for now, just the way we are doing it. If First Majestic's $150 and you can pay $30, what's the intrinsic value there is what, how we would refer to it. What is parity? What is the intrinsic value? 150 minus 30. That's 120. Right. And 120 divided by 0. 0.1. You're just moving the decimal. If when you divide by yeah, 12,000, just move it one one spot over. So you'd get what? It's 12,000, isn't it? Did you say 0. 0.01? 0. 0.1. Oh, 0.1. 1,200. Right. So if you had put a, bought a thousand dollars worth of those for a dime and you have a 1200 to one re, uh, return, how much does that leave you with? A million two. Right. When you started with a thousand dollars and you turned it into a million two, again, that's up to each individual person to decide, but I mean, geez, it's like, <laughs> all right, with the last one we came up with, it took 58 and a third years to, you know, you could have that on every month. I don't even feel like my brain's already like, I don't want to calculate, you know, what it comes up to, but you get what I'm saying. Like the numbers get silly 
and if you can back these things at which it can get slightly more involved but just keeping it simple now again does that help answer your question of why whether it's right or not is for other anyone else to decide on their own but just at least why does it make sense now why i would approach it like i have in uh, some of those situations oh yeah i i, I completely understand um I, I guess my my question is is are you basing this on the triggering event being the enactment because it seems to me the, the hard part is the timing of the triggering event. I have no doubt it's going to happen. Right. Um, I just don't, you know, I don't want to get into year 58 and the scenario before, before it comes true, because then I'm out a whole lot on naked calls that, that didn't finish in the money. That's, that's sort of my take on it is how do you weigh those two to come up with the best strategy? Well, the way I like to think about these things, I'm going to try and get a little bit more into the light here. And we'll take some questions, but we won't go all night on this one. Actually, this uh, that's all right. It's situated here. The way I like to do it, and this is certainly multiple ways to approach it, but I like to start with what do I think is going to happen? So this could be Basel three. I don't know, maybe someone thinks, you know, uh, <laughs> might not necessarily be incorrect that the guys doing this stuff are big occultists and, you know, you crack some code and think, all right, they're going to do it on, you know, July 3rd or August 4th, whenever they're going to do whatever you think they're going to do. Or maybe you just say, you know what, I think by the end of three years from now, the thing has to explode higher start with what you think is going to happen so and and the way i'd look at it is that all right you know three years from now i actually have a sheet written out about this where i said uh for 2020 i had a 50 50 sh shot of the comex blowing up i think i put like 80 percent in 2021 90 percent in 2022 95 percent by 2023 98 percent by 2024 anyone you can put your different uh parameters in there but if you do something like that you know you don't the goal isn't i mean nobody knows it's not like you have to get it exact but then you do a weighted average you say like all right there's 10 percent chance of this plus 20 percent chance of this plus 30 percent chance of this then you kind of have a value and a way to frame it and you can look at the different options and you can construct anything you want that's the part that that that's really fun about this. But if you start with what do I think is going to happen, then you have something to compare it to. All right, well, they're charging this much for this option. And if I hit this, this, this or that, this is what it will look like. And then you can decide, well, if I like that, I can take this trade. Maybe you don't like it. You don't do it. Um, and, you know, we got into it a little bit today. We won't go too more deeply, uh, but I mean, I think you saw how maybe you think, all right, this has to happen within five years, or maybe you think it has to happen within 10 years is the longest you think it goes on. You could re just back out that same process we did. All right, the, what was the first one was uh, 16 and two thirds years and it went up to 58, so, you can back out the math, uh, you know, and just reverse engineer what we did until you find the, the scenario that fits what you're mentioning. But I would start with thinking about what is it you think is going to happen and start there. Does that make sense, Wayne? Yes, thank you. All right. So um, with that said, one last thing, and then we will go to questions here. The other option you have, let's say rather than buying the next, because especially in this scenario, this would be a great time uh, for what is called a calendar spread. Let's say I'm not too concerned about these next couple of weeks, but I really want to target as specifically June 28th. So let's call this one a dime. I mean, you most likely I mean, you probably wouldn't get filled for a dime. Although, you know, 
First Majestic's down like a dollar tomorrow. You'll see the vol on these get crushed. And due to the stock move, we won't get into all that, but these will change. Um, but to keep things simple, let's look at, there's June 25th. So here you see the 30 strike is six cents at 13 cents. Make this be actually more accurate. Let's look at the midpoint. Let's call this one a dime. And we'll say July 2nd, a week later, six at 17. So let's call this one 13 cents. So maybe you could get, let's say if you could get filled here for 13 cents to buy all 18 of those days. But if you say, you know what? I just want to be long on... Hopefully you guys can still see me. Sun going down here in Mexico, but um, at least if you can see the board is what's important and we'll start getting close to wrapping up. But rather than paying 13 cents for the whole 18 days, if I don't really care about prior to June 25th, if this one's 13 in June, so I could buy that and sell this one, I could buy that week for three cents, which is actually what I am thinking I will most likely do. Um, now, probably if you're doing something like that, I would definitely recommend not doing these individually because you'll get better pricing. And there's electronic order books for stuff like this. So, you know, it's, this, and this is what uh, made me really think to be a good time to do an option call again, because yeah, maybe I could pay, uh, let's call it the 13 cents here. But the way this particular situation is set up, I remember I heard someone say something's happening on the 21st and hey, you know, can they do something early or whatever they're rolling out? How does it go? Uh, you know, we shall see. But essentially, if you think it's really going to be specific to that week, then you can rerun all those numbers we just did. And uh, actually, Rob, as I go, uh, there's a spot with some light. So I'm going to go there so you guys can see me. But Rob, while I do that, would you be kind enough to do the math if on the 30 strike, if you did the calendar, which you paid three cents for, and now the intrinsic value of your position is $120, what is your multiple return? Uh, you make 4,000, so the multiple would be 4,000 divided by whatever you put into it. Huh? Is that right? I'm not following you on it. What is 120 divided by 0 0.03? 4,000. Oh. Point, point zero 0.03? Yeah, it's 4,000. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't under, I just didn't misunderstood you. So... So the multiple is 4,000 divided by your original investment, right? No, no, no. If your multiple is 4,000 times your original investment, if you put $1,000 in that position and you're getting 4,000 to one, what did you just end up with? Four million. Yeah. Well, that's nice. <laughs> right? It's not a bad day at the office. Jeez, you're not yep. even gonna smile over that one. I thought you'd be happy. <laughs> not at all, and you could prob probably buy the resort you're in right now. <laughs> I would think so. Uh, okay, thank you, Travis, for enjoying the conceivable possibility of uh, making four million dollars out of one thousand. I'm glad that you liked that, mm -hmm. Travis. Would you like to share your thoughts on that uh, option scenario? I love that scenario, Chris. Um, I don't think you went big enough. For Rob to get a uh, to get a reaction there. <laughs> okay, Travis. Well, then let me ask you this. Oh, we're good. Okay. All right, Travis knows how to get Rob to giggle a little bit. So, <laughs> Travis, what do you think? Let's say that Alistair. Mc... Did you hear Alistair McLeod's uh, interview on Reluctant Preppers last week? No, I did okay. not. He felt pretty confident. Um, by the way, I apologize. Uh, I know uh, a couple of people saw we had a tab up with Alistair today. Um, that was me not getting my time zones right, but we'll get him on this week. 
it's going to be Thursday, but let's say he's right. Anyone who thinks there's going to be like an end of the bullion bang trading, or let's say there's a reset price. Let's say they, they, they do Basel three or there's a reset or whatever you want to call it. What do you think? I don't know. I mean, we could make the case that 150 bucks and hundred dollars for silver is conservative. Don't give me what you would say to like, you know, normal people in public. Give me your gut reaction. What do you, when this thing really blows up, what do you think is going to happen? Give me a number. Ooh, man. Um, I think it's going to surprise even the most bullish. That's not a number. Come on. No hedging here. Come on. We're not treasury investors. Throw it out there. Don't, don't be shy. I'd say $500 an ounce. All right. And uh, Rob, okay. We have $500 an ounce silver on the table now. What is the price of First Majestic Silver, sir? Five. Okay. Sorry, I was responding to a reader question. So $500 ounce silver under what scenario? If Alistair McLeod's prediction comes correct and the LBMA you could have the Easter Bunny comes in corners of the market. I don't care. <laughs> okay. If you have $500 silver, let's uh, say on June 29th, what's the price of First Majestic? And Michael Sayer, you're on deck. So get ready. I'll say, God, First Majestic there might be three grand to share. Three grand to share. Okay, where's Michael Sayer? Come on, Michael. I know you're out there. All right, Travis, you are back on the spot here. So now let's pull up our option board again, just so we can see it. Travis, <laughs> this alien hunting uh, flying saucer boy, Rob over here is talking about 3000. What are we is $3,000 first majestic in that flying saucer you're talking about? Is that right? <laughs> Did I remember the number right? 3000 you said? That's what I said. Okay, so Travis, you own the 30 strike on $3,000 First Majestic Silver. So what is the intrinsic value of that option? What is 3,000 minus 30? 270, or uh, 2,970. Yes, sir. And uh, Travis, since, you know, you're, you know, you're not like, you were smarter. You didn't go to business school like me. So you have a couple of brain cells left. Fortunately, it sounds like. So if you have your, your 2970 divided by 0 0.03 would be. That would be. Divided by what did you say? 0.3. We're paying uh, three, oh, no, three cents for this theoretical spread. So what anyone at home, what is 29.70 divided by 0 0.03? Jesus. <laughs> 99 million? I'm getting 99,000. No, that's yes. a multiple, 99,000 to one multiple on $3,000 First Majestic, which divided by, uh, or no, 99, that's 99,000 to one. And if you put $1,000 on that spread and you hit 99,000 to one, <laughs> what, what has your, uh, your capital turned into now? Is anybody else getting 99 million from a thousand? What it looks yes. like. So now keep in mind if that actually happened, geez, I, 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 I wonder uh, like how they would resolve that. I mean, it's like, you're going to blow out the exchanges. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just like on a thousand lot, you know, so uh, perhaps before we turn it over to questions, now that we've seen some of the possibilities, one of the things that I've been thinking about for the past 10 years, and especially more relevant now where we see brokerages switching and saying you only buy one share of First Majestic. I mean, let's say that we woke up and there was a reset. First Majestic is even like a hundred bucks and you had this on. I mean, it, 
I've called before and found out, all right, if I have something in there and I sell position, how quickly can I have that out of the system and then call it wired to Andy Sheckman and put it in bullion or something else? Because if you have a position worth $99 million while the whole system is blowing up, I don't know how that's going to work out, but I'd much rather have that money already converted into bullion than being frozen in TD Ameritrade or something else where someone can control it. So keep in mind that if you hit this and if you're putting something or any of these things, I mean, obviously these numbers are a bit extreme and, you know, we'll find out one day, uh, you know, what the numbers go to. But that's something that I've thought a lot about. And I've even gone through the exercise of calling them. Probably should do it again. Just saying, all right, you know, uh, how quickly, if I have a position and I wanted to liquidate it and I would wire it out that day because it's interesting. I mean, I would imagine not all brokerages would know this is coming. Maybe some would, given the way these deals work. But um, let's say like we woke up I don't know if it'd be halted immediately, but certainly, you know, if you hit, I mean, if you put a thousand dollars in and we're like, oh, well, I made 10 million today, but I might be able to make 15 by lunchtime. You know, you may want to keep in mind, let's make sure you get your money back, especially we know you're dealing with criminals. So just a- So I have, a, I have a comment. Yes, sir. Chris. So that's a good scenario um, for probably everybody on this call. <laughs> um, you know, I'm a big, you know, I, I have quite a bit of just physical silver on, on hand myself and been, and been buying it for a few years. And, uh, you know, I think it's fun for us to play the action game on this. But the reality of it, the more that I think about it, is if that scenario plays out that we just described, trying to wire money out so that I can buy more physical silver, we would, we would absolutely uh, deplete any remaining silver stocks that would be on hand at that point. I mean, there would be no silver available under that scenario because so many people would have hit that are wanting to convert to physical with all their fiat dollars that they just made paper paper dollars that they just made on this trade and at that point there's nothing to convert it to because there is no physical silver to go buy because it's gone right at least in that quantity you're not going to get that you're not going to get that quantity right and so that's the part that i'm just like how would that really play out would we you'd pretty much have to have the, the silver that you wanted to have before it happens, because it's not going to be one of those things that you can go get it later. If we only have black and white, I might agree, but what if we uh, can go in between the lines, which often makes things more fun? Maybe you're not buying physical silver. Maybe, uh, you know, True. into the crypto suggested the cryptos or another asset, or maybe you pay off your mortgage or correct more. And they're great questions to be asking. Now, here's the other thing. Now, you said, what if everybody's doing this? First of all, how many people are even putting this on or thinking of it? I mean, we're all complete Fruit Loop alien hunters here. So I don't know why anybody would be even listening or thinking about silly things that can be calculated mathematical and have such large numbers, especially when, as Colin points out, Jeff Curry buys physical copper instead of silver. So if you're investing with the alleged smart money in the United States, most people wouldn't be in any condition to do anything like this. And your, your scenario also assumed that of all the people who are theoretically doing this, that they've also thought about it early and taken the time even to go through thinking of the question you just asked and then asking it. Because once you ask it, now your subconscious is thinking about different possibilities. And anyone who's listening here, their mind is like, oh, I never thought of that. So now yeah. you're assuming that everybody else who has put on that trade has also done what you've just done and is going to do it at the same time as you. Uh... True. You'll have some people that'll be more lucky than others in that scenario because some people will time it perfectly. Some people won't time it as well. Um 
you know, whatever the case may be. But the amount of money that somebody could realistically make on a leveraged trade like that, um, you know, like you said, you you call Miles Franklin and say, hey, I just hit a $100 million trade in, uh, in my options account here. I'd like to get that into bullion tomorrow. Is he just going to laugh off, you know, laugh you off the phone? Because he's like, there's absolutely no way silver's at this price now. It's not going to happen. We can't. We can't even get our hands. I don't think he would laugh you off the soon. phone because yeah. you probably wouldn't be able to get him on the phone. We saw what <laughs> right exactly even better went from twenty seven to thirty. So right, I, I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen. I don't know, but I can yeah. tell you that I think it's quite wise to be thinking about these things now, and that's why I'm saying that's that's also a risk. I personally, here's what I, you know, obviously this is what I'm really playing right here. You know, holding these is likely going to be what saved your bacon. And, you know, having what you feel is the appropriate amount, depending on what your thoughts are and what's going to happen over the next, Absolutely. call it months, years, whatever, decades. Um, you know, my thoughts is I'm, I'm kind of thinking that money that I'm playing, cause I'm playing some first majestic and I'm playing a couple of these mining companies too with smaller dollars, but my real money is in physical silver. And, um, my thoughts would be that money. If I hit it, if I say I get lucky and I hit a big, a big trade in the, uh, in the options market on this, on this, uh, you know, the Comex shuts down, whatever. I would like to convert those dollars to something physical, obviously, but it would not be silver under that scenario. It would be something else. Maybe it's like a resort where you're staying at or a, uh, you know, a piece of land or, you know, maybe I want to help some friends and family, what, whatever the case is. Um, that's probably my, my thought with that money that I'm leveraging up so much is because, you know, that physical silver is going to be what I, ultimately uh am gonna have to count on anyway under that scenario that we're describing so that's just my two cents you're saying there makes a lot of sense there's not a single right answer but what i've found especially as the years go by everybody on here if you're listening to me like even like once a month talk about silver you're so over prepared for what's going to happen Life, I don't believe life is designed that we're supposed to know everything to the decimal point, but all the things that you've thought of while you're studying this, while other people don't even know that it's happening, I would suggest don't worry about, you know, in fact, after tonight, don't like sit here after we wrap up tonight and be like trying to calculate out all this stuff. Go do something fun. Take your mind completely away from it. You're the things you've been thinking about, not just tonight, but for the last couple of years that led all of you here. That's going to get you through whatever happens, your human instinct that you feel prepared, even if you don't feel completely prepared, even if you know this is going on, you've thought about things that most other people haven't. And I think everything you're bringing up, Travis, is great. I just say don't feel like there's a specific right answer. Just have fun thinking yeah. about it. Um, by the way, we do have the forum open on the Arcadia site. I'll show that real quick. Um, so if anyone, and that was the whole point of that, so that, you know, maybe uh, someone wants to post, hey, I, they were looking at the scenarios and they think this and other people want to comment on it. You go to the community tab here. I haven't even gone on there yet. I don't know if we have anyone. I guess we have 977 members, whatever that means. Uh, Yara, is this up in uh, active now? It is up in active. We do have 900. We have, have almost 1,000 people in there, but there are, are have not been any posts yet. So um, that is something that you can just click on the community tab and sign up and start topics or conversations. We could post this link there and then have a chat underneath it if people want to do that, but it is ready to roll. And Chris, I see you still driving there. If you can hear me, maybe you or someone else that I saw, thank you for posting that information I see in the chat. 
You know, uh, I get people telling me, hey, we should contact this guy. We should contact that guy. I'm in agreement with all of them. I'm writing as many emails, I'm actually trying to get some semblance of a real life back. But I mean, if anyone has ideas, here's a great place to post them. The only rule is you don't have to agree, but please be respectful and positive. If you think someone's an asshole, <laughs> great, go think that, but be, you will be removed. That's the only thing. I don't even the comments on the videos, uh, you know, it's, it's fine. You don't have to agree, but just act as if you're in someone's house. And, uh, and I don't think that's going to be an issue for anyone here, but great place. Uh, I'll start getting on there more. Uh, and whether it's suggestions of who to contact with legal stuff or if people want option trades, we'll, uh, or discuss option trades, we'll figure out how to do that. So no one's, uh, getting the wrong idea but um you know it was kind of funny i've even wondered what the how, how do i how would i even know what the compliance rules are i can't get any answers from the cftc so um in either case uh that's a good place to discuss them so timothy zub i see you've got your hand raised there uh so take it away sir yeah i have a question <clears throat> so if you want to keep a constant position to ca capture this upside whenever it goes in the next 12, 24 months. Is it better to, to, to buy contracts over like over the next 60 days and then buy another one or to, to buy one that's out uh, 120 days or, or to, the, to the beginning of the new year? Uh, like, is there a better, are they cheaper to buy them shorter and just keep buying them? Or is it better to buy a long one? Just to I'll, give you, I'll give you a very precise and specific answer as all things in life, it depends. Yeah, <laughs> you know? generally you now if it was going to happen in one shot and actually i've thought about uh, i have a quant uh, team i need to get back to at some point uh because i mean i'd like to actually calculate out the math although i mean it's like one of those infinite possibilities the short answer is if it happened in a one-shot thing and you could just keep rolling it over at a dime. Generally, I, I'm pretty sure, I maybe want to double check, but my guess would be, and I'm pretty sure, actually, we can look. Actually, let's take a look. Let's not guess. Um, I think it's going to be, it would be in a straightforward scenario cheaper. So let's say, uh, what is today's date? June 8th. So let's look at July 9th, which is about a month away. <coughs> so, all right, July 9th. So there the, uh, so that's about a month out, 22 trading days, five trading days in a week. So almost a little over four weeks. So here, let's say, uh, let's just call it, let's just call it 20 cents to make math easy. So, 20 cents times 12 would be $2.40, right? That sound right, Timothy? Is that 12, 12, day, 12 days, is that? or If a month costs 20 cents, we want to look at the year. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, so figure it out, cost like an insurance policy per day. So 20 cents times 12 months is $2.40, right? Yeah. So let's look at... Uh, Hmm. So we'll actually, I mean, we'll make some interesting calculations here. We don't have, there's not a year from today it would be June of 2022. And you see in 2022, oh, actually there's an April. How about that? Um, okay. So actually, you know what we can do? Uh, so the 30 line, so here's one quick way. They're saying 216 trading days till April of 22 and uh, July 9th, 22. So that should be about 10 to one, 216 divided by 22. So April was 216 days, July is 22 trading days. So that's 9.8. Okay, so about a 10 to one multiple and uh if you see so here this is two dollars or 20 cents so if you roll that over 10 times 
at 20 cents, which is an assumption that may not necessarily hold. Because what right. if what if First Majestic goes up four bucks? It doesn't have the big move. First Majestic goes up four dollars. The price of this, when you roll it over next month, is going to go higher. Yeah. So it depends on how it gets there, and you can you know do all sorts of modeling and mapping things out. Um, but just to keep the basic concept, so here, if you roll that over ten times, you're looking at two bucks versus April. Oh, well, I'm surprised uh, that. So in this case, it looks like it would be cheaper. So if you wanted until next April, at least unless I'm missing something, I'm actually surprised it's that much cheaper. Uh, so yeah, you could, uh, you know, if you don't want to be like doing one month and you think, you know, maybe not Basel three doesn't get you excited, but you know, by next April, something's going to happen in this scenario again 30 strike 216 days they are charging they're calling it a buck 30 and july 9th which is 22 days out oh i was looking at the wrong oh wait july 9th the 30 strike oh no that was the right one so 20 cents wow that's interesting now keep in mind you have a couple other factors that we won't dig into too deeply tonight, but the volatility levels actually, which you can see back here will be different for different months. Also, you know, when you hear volatility, that kind of refers to at the money, you can have different skews. Like people think for some reason, something really might happen. There might be a higher, like the far, like that, 10 delta out of the money option might be, uh, or 10 cent dollar out of the money option. I don't know to explain this clearly, but there's a lot of parameters that these boards can get twisted. So um, at least based on the way it's lining up right now, if you wanted to do it till next April, it looks like it would be a bit cheaper, a good bit cheaper to just buy the longer term. I'm surprised to, to see that because I've found usually and this here, you see the at the money volatility, July 9th, 55. So this is even, uh, that's odd. But anyway, uh, the best thing is not, I mean, you can guess, but then also just take a look and see what the board is offering. Yeah. And keep in mind, most of the world thinks you're a complete moron. They think I'm a complete moron too. Probably one of us is right. So don't, just because the board is like pricing these things in, I mean, doesn't necessarily mean they're right. Maybe they are, maybe we are, but that's the bet you're making. And, uh, you know, if you're right and you have it on, you'll clobber them and they'll probably cheat. But if you kind of go through what Travis was talking about before you can, I mean, again, that's why I would say like, get your physical silver first, get mining shares before you're doing this, uh, get whatever is appropriate for you. Don't, don't, I wouldn't. Don't mortgage your house to put this on. Oh, this is just a, don't do that. But get yeah. it, capture this. So if it happens, you have this little bit of the gravy that comes in to help you deal with it. It's a great way to take some educated guesses at really a lottery ticket. And I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I guess, did I win or not? It's a hard one to answer. I put the bet on twice in a bigger size and i think fundamentally i was right and you know they're gonna you know you already know they're gonna cheat in any way possible to change the rules and screw you, you know that if you don't like if you don't know that or you don't like that then don't even consider doing this would be my advice but you know if you time it right i mean for example i don't know if i had sold the thing on february 1st you know i would would add a bit extra but the, the trade-off, now similar to the covered call before, yeah, $190,000, $200,000 is certainly a lot of money. You put that in physical silver and then you get that post-reset would be great. Although that's the trade-off. You know, I'm, you know, someone can say maybe I should have or shouldn't, and that's my choice, but I wanted to leave it on because <laughs> you would have guessed that the CFTC commissioner was price fixing the silver market. Um, or actually, I guess I could have guessed that, but 
I mean, that's what I'm like to at least explore is getting, I don't know if I'm going to get the 99 million outcome, but I don't know that I would even attempt to do that, but partly, and this is going to be different for everyone, but just an interesting little note. I remember uh, I actually talked with this guy that used to trade with at Susquehanna. I mean, it's like, I feel I was meant to do silver stuff. This guy was meant to do options. So he's a beast. He's, he started at the same time. He's still there. And um, I was just picking his brain because he does it every day. I'm a little rusty, at least on that level. And but I just remember there was a part of me and this is going to be different for each person, but it was like, you know what? And I remember thinking in the weeks leading up and as I was talking with him about it, based on my life, not anybody else's, but if I put, I remember thinking, if I put that on and I lose my money, I can live with that. But if I think this is going to happen and I didn't put it on and it did happen, like just that, that would be hard, hard for me. And that helped me to make my decision. And I guess I must have really started doing that even before the GameStop thing happened. I mean, I don't, it's funny. I've been wanting to review those old option calls, uh, you know, all happened so quick, but what I remember, you know, I've been sitting here for a decade waiting whenever this happens, I wanted to be like, I just kept training my subconscious, show me something that whatever it takes for me to put a bet on, before it happens that's what i've spent the last decade of my life doing and that's what the show is i mean partly about but um you know everybody else has their own financial situation your own thing please do can don't do this consult someone you trust who knows your situation uh you're, i mean it's risky but you know that's I'm not telling anybody else what to do, but just how I balanced it and, you know, the factors I think about and there's no right answer, but uh, hopefully that's helpful. And uh, that answer that, Tim. Yeah. Cool. Well, we have uh, Saskia's iPad that is interested in a question. Uh, so if Saskia or Saskia's iPad would like to uh, toss that in there, uh, you are on the board. All right, I see it's still muted. I'll ask to unmute or I will. Oh. Saskia, all right, go ahead. Uh, can, you hear me? can you hear me? I can. Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you for all your good work. And secondly, everybody. Work, to... but thank you, sir. <laughs> I think I'm technically unemployed uh, and I don't remember having a job in the last five years, but I'll stop interrupting and let you ask your question. Okay. So everybody speaks about $50 or $100 or $150 silver. So let's say in two weeks, something gets reset and we hit $75 by silver and whatever 2,300, 2,800 in gold. What will happen? How do you think the mining stocks will be re-evaluated? <laughs> I mean, I imagine they'll be a lot higher. <laughs> how, 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 what do you think? How high do they go? 30%, 50%, 100%? I mean, especially for the companies that really have a resource. I mean, if you have $75 silver, if there's like silver refrigerator, I mean, if like the company name is like uh, silver refrigerators and that is not, they're not like a silver mining company, like people are just going to be buying any, it's gonna be like the cryptos. Any mining stock is going to go insane. That's going to be, look at what you saw happen in February. Yeah, okay. not the pricing but just all of a sudden like cnbc is bringing on the guy from jm bullion they're they're wheeling jeff curry out there to commit felonies you know they're changing perspectives <laughs> they're putting it on uh, wall street journal had an article about wall street journal's commodity section they have like one article a week and they're even writing about silver manipulation so that's why i've heard people and i would tend to think this is likely the case 
I think $30 is the magic number. It's like probably by the time it goes through 30, they get their doors blown off. So maybe they know that's about to happen. And that Basel three is like, all right, we're fucked. <laughs> Game's over. Um, but it's like, you're going to like, let alone when it goes through 30, let alone 35, 40, I'm not a technical analyst by any means, but based on my studies of human psychology, I think it'll be pretty wild to see once it finally pops through 50. And that'll probably be, I would have to think even more significant. I mean, gold going through 2000 was a big one, but it's like as much as gold is, you know, what it is, I think like breaking $50 silver is going to, have bigger implications than gold went through 2000 bucks and we were excited, but um, I think by the time silver finally breaks through $50, we're going to have some, we'll probably be stuff even far wilder than that happening in the world. So well, I think, I think we stay in front of it, huh? don't we? And I mean, the last thing, you know, theoretically on these, you get leverage on these uh, mining companies. Simple example, let's say silver was $14 and uh, let's say cost of production is $14 and silver is 15 bucks. 15, go if silver goes from 15 to 20, it's gone up 33%, <clears throat> but the profit margin of a miner has gone from $1 to $6. That's brute awkward basic version of the leverage so that's why again you know you would could make the case that it could be, theoretically should go up a lot more than one to one i would imagine that it probably will because there'll be so much money flooding into such few scarce resources and uh you know, but keep in mind, it's not going to be like what it should do. There's going to be money flying around by people. Like if, if you think you're going to be, if you, if we think we're going to be confused, people don't even know how to spell silver. They're not going to know what the fuck's going on. And they're, that's going to be what's pricing this. So maybe here's a better way of, maybe here's a realistic way to, of looking at it. If you use what you've seen in the cryptos over the past five years as whenever this thing breaks, or if Basel three goes through and you said, all right, my silver stock's going to do something similar to Bitcoin or, you know, some of the altcoins. Is that at least a reasonable starting point in a discussion? Uh, Chris, what was, was it Rob Kirby that you were reading that book and he said what the average uh, stock went, uh, it was the Doug average Casey said between 1962 oh, and 1968 when silver doubled from about buck 09 to 250. He says the average penny stock went up 150x. Now I haven't seen those numbers or if that's actually how it went or I don't know if that's how it will go this time, but if that's even close to accurate, you're going to have a mania. It's going to be, I mean, you've had, <laughs> we're in like, Biff's world from Back to the Future 2, Central Bankers Gone Wild, Janet Yellen's running her mouth with some silly comment one after another. And you have Tesla going up. What, what the heck is Tesla up at now? I don't even look at the thing, but it was the last time I looked, it was up 20 fold since they started those swap lines in 2019. So, I mean, like, what is silver going to do? I mean, you have... I don't know. I like to think I thought of things a little bit this way when I was back on the trading floor, but certainly studying some different things since then. If you think about the energy of a market or of anything, there's all this pent up frustration that we've all lived through uh, and all this stuffing reality. I don't know. It's like, it seems the beach ball stuff pretty darn far under the water and it's going to set off to Pluto by the time it's finally released. By the way, you have to listen to Sean Claude and Rob Kirby's uh, interview on last week. They just let loose. Did I listen to whose interview last week? 
Sean Claude and uh, Rob Kirby. Sean from SGC. Sean Claude. Sean Claude from, Sean Claude. from Beyond Physics. Oh, uh, I didn't hear a Rob Kirby interview, but uh, it's worth checking out. Check that out. It's worth checking out. They just yeah. Rob just let go. Okay. Yeah, I know Rob. Like Rob gets <laughs> fired up. So uh, fascinating. fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and again, that's part of the thing that's fun. By all means, I don't know. I give the I do my best to share what I'm seeing, but. I don't know. Probably there's probably gonna be like some guy that nobody's ever heard of that's looking at some, you know, un, some piece of data I never would have thought of, and that's why one of the things that I focused on that I, I like to think has gone well, you know, and the trading floor was good training. I I and I hope this comes across. I'm not going out there trying to like jam my view down and tell everybody else why it's right, but that's why I bring the other people on the show and, and get other opinions, you know, and just learn. And, you know, and uh, I was just reading this incredible, oh, my new favorite book ever. It's so magical. And I think we'll all be benefiting from that. Um, but talks about, oh, um, geez, what was I just going to say? Uh, oh, yeah, how really, uh, when you start showing people others or teach something and help other people understand i mean this is really a, a what a pleasure and benefit or not pleasure too but what a privilege benefit that my own thinking grows when i'm explaining to someone else so again uh you know certainly i'm going to give you guys the I, I promise whatever i say will be genuine and honest i don't know if you get everything right but by all means uh listen to other views and but at some point see what makes sense but begin forming your own and this idea that only like some idiot who works on wall street is smart enough to have an opinion that's that's the whole paper tiger bluff that's how they take your money by making them think but if you actually whatever degree you want to maybe some people want to go really deep into it but just you know, don't listen to Jeff Curry, even if whether it's options or just, hey, should I buy more silver? Should I, I don't know, should I sell silver? Listen to what's out there, hear the different views, decide, but then, you know, don't be, it's okay to then say like, you know what, well, this is what I think. And, 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 be, and be comfortable with that and, you know, and just keep learning and, you know, you're going to be. Well, I'm buying, I'm buying myself i'm buying silver since 2010 well i Every hope you invited to your mansion one day saskia's ipad <laughs> you have a party with a nice hot tub and you'll let your buddy silver chris come over silver chris will be coming over <laughs> well i'll be looking forward to it maybe we'll have it july and uh if not again uh you've seen part of our location for a potential silver well potential location for what will be happening October uh, Halloween week, big Halloween party. Nibbles is already excited for Silverfest too. So thank you, Saskia. I guess thank geez, you kindly. It's already been two and a half hours here. Goodness, uh, option trading talk can be fun. Let's take a couple last quick questions. Uh, I'm gonna keep answers quick here, so maybe one per person. But. Braden, you were up next. Anybody else who does have a question, raise your hand. I want to get to at least everybody uh, answer quickly, but also start wrapping up soon. So Braden, uh, go ahead, sir. Thank you so much, Chris. You are uh, the best thing that's happened to this industry. You're a gem and we thank you. Um, long time investor in silver, lots of physical, lots of mining. Question is why first majority? Majestic when it comes both from a, a spreading risk perspective, if you take say a Hecla or Elant or any of them, we all know Keith and love him, but why first Majestic and would you kind of spread that out over two or three names as far as the, the out of the money call option strategy? I mean, it doesn't by any means have to be just first Majestic. Every Everything we went through tonight, and I will be posting this on the YouTube channel, so you can review, rewind that section where we go through the math as many times until it makes sense. Even if it's confusing, just be patient, keep going through it. That's how you learn it. Um, but I mean, you could apply this to any stock and I do it on other ones too. Uh, 
uh lexco has listed options silvercrest does uh fortuna i don't know i'm not uh, yeah, leverage where do you find the best leverage i guess that if you're if you're safely invested fundamentally and you really just want torque you want the lottery ticket do you think first majestic offers the most the best options out of the money the most liquidity etc i don't know if there's one best one i mean they're different First Majestic, you probably have better liquidity. If you told me Alexco, you know, which is, a, I've thought about that, you know, it's a smaller stock. So you're just trying to jam more money into something, you know, kind of along the lines of that quote from Doug Casey, where the penny stocks on a return basis could go up the most versus First Majestic. I mean, it'll go up a lot, but I mean, it's, uh, another thing I looked at is some of the ones, uh, the two silver alleged indices, SIL and SILJ. I will leave aside my thoughts on whether SILJ, or no, I won't leave them aside. Uh, the idea that they're calling that a silver junior minor index is so ridiculous that uh, old man Kranzler and a few other people were already creating our own Arcadia silver junior minor index, which will actually represent what I think people would be looking for when they're buying a uh, junior minor index uh because what's it if you look at the companies that are in there it's like pan american silver first majestic i love first majestic but they're not a silver junior miner i mean they have yamana gold hecla some of the companies they have in both indices like hecla is in sil and the silj so that part seems a little silly although i guess what uh the takeaway is that I don't know, in a world where you're going to have a ton of money flying in just at anything with silver in the name, there's like billions of dollars like flying at silver stocks. Like, I don't know, maybe these guys don't know what Alexco is, but they're like, I mean, a lot of people buy the indexes. There is an indices. Indexes? Braden, are they indexes or indices? What do you think? I've always liked indexes indexes all right cool i'm down with that too so people i'm sure there's a lot of people just buying the indexes and now this is something that we'll call in the potential free roll category but a great uh concept from option trading you know i don't know maybe there'll be no difference but i i remember thinking uh, i think hecla was in both first majestics in both so Again, we're guessing, but I don't know. I mean, does it make sense? Well, maybe, you know, hey, a company that's in both of those and, you know, a lot of money's flying at those. Could that boost that stock's return just because of there's always different places of edge and things like that that people don't think of? And maybe it will or maybe it won't, but it's like, well, let's say I think Hecla and some other stock that isn't in both of those indexes, let's say I have the same fundamentally you know business wise i think all else is equal but this but hecla is in both of indexes you know well then that's like that made me i'm like okay that could be a good one uh you know maybe there's a stock that you know really well or there's a particular stock you think you know people are going to find out about those are the kind of things i would think about although probably the best thing would be don't try to overthink it this is not going to be priced like, you know, everyone on the planet is like, oh, well, they have 0.3 grams per ton and their mill uh, had an extra 98% recovery. It's not going to be, it's going to be mania. It's going to be insane. So, you know, have fun, think about it, but just, I guess the biggest thing I've learned in my life, I, I was always, my dad forced me to study like a robot, but now as I've learned a little bit to relax and just let, things flow a little bit more naturally uh, makes things go a lot better and if you get some balance there so have fun thinking about it discuss it but don't try to overthink it because anyone that tells you they know how one of these stocks is really going to react anyone who tells you they know like which stock is going to go up more by exactly how much when silver is hitting a hundred dollars i'd be cautious of that unless it's uh, blue horseshoe grandy um then i uh blue horseshoe what do you say you got any final parting words for us joe grandy 
Blue Horseshoe. All right, he's on the mute. He's probably already buying up all the options in the uh, overseas markets, knowing the savvy investor he is. Does anybody else have any questions before we wrap this baby up? Chris. Hey, thanks. Um, I don't want to take anybody's time here. And I have a poor connection here. So um, my question was centered on, you might've answered it when I was driving, is with the Basel uh, three coming, do we want to focus on one or the other? Gold, I mean, I've, a lot of the other um, like podcasts and YouTubers are, are kind of saying, you know, it's gold is going to drive this Basel th three. And I think we're all pretty much silver people. I cut my teeth on the silver game this year, broke my first thousand ounces and have been happy that I'm doing it. But um, in regards to the Basel three um, requiring banks to hold a certain percentage of gold, should we focus on those, on those gold um, stocks and companies? Another one, and there's not a set answer. I mean, I think what you're saying makes sense. Uh, and if you feel more comfortable with gold, then probably that might be what's good for you. My guess is, geez, if they like some, if they somehow like reset the gold price, like if even gold went up to like 2,500 bucks, I don't know. Is that enough? Like that... And okay, it's still getting hard, like you know, like there's a lot. Of, how much more can happen? And you keep stuffing silver under 25. All right, you can run a hyperinflation campaign, you can have Janet yelling, run her mouth every like other week about how our interest rates are going to go up and it's great for the country. And I didn't even get to make a video about it today. Some of these headlines, like I'm now, like as you get used to it over and over. I mean, you could like spot these a mile away. It's like, all right, they're saying uh, high interest rates. It means they're going to clobber it next day. And, you know, they probably even have this stuff all programmed out. Well, we'll tell them high interest rates today. And then, oh, yeah, what do they, let me ask, uh, then we'll get the inflation report. And then, oh, well, we're not going to do the higher interest rates. So they're, you know, probably, uh, holy Jesus, I saw the, the expected number. Uh, I don't even, is that, anybody know is inflation? Is that the number come out this week? Anybody know that? Someone maybe can put it in the chat. Whatever it is, I saw they were there expected was 4.7 on the CPI. I was like, oh my God. It's, it's like usually they just lie rather than come up. I've never heard of a number over four like they had last month. I didn't think it ever, ever happened before. And so uh, uh, Steve Mueller says it's this Thursday. All right. So that should be a hoot. Chris, I mean, I, I wish I knew the answer, uh, but I, I'll, I'll put it like this. If, if they do something that resets gold, I mean, anything's possible, but I don't know. I wouldn't be, I, I don't know. I mean, I'd probably just, I'm not saying it's right, but I'll would imagine I probably, if I'm putting this, I'll both put something on and I'll be most likely doing it. I would be doing the silver stocks. That's my question. So basically the options that you, you kind of laid out for us today, which was really awesome. I, cause I also, I've got a, quite a few options opened up through four October um, just to kind of wait and see how this whole weirdness unfolds. Um, but with this Basel three, I was curious if you're going to open anything up for that specifically. I mean, we'll find out one of these days, you know, <laughs> But again, like I, I'll put that in the category of a great thing to think through. If you're having fun and you're like, wow, it's interesting to think if this happens, what if that happens? As long as you're enjoying that or discuss it with your friends or you're in the calls like this or in comments or on the forum, the big, the, nobody's going to know, but that's, that's how you're training yourself to become better at this. Cause yeah, I mean, all right, Basel three or reset will come and go, but you know, if, Hey, if this feels like work, don't put your money into this to begin with, but. No, I, I watched but, my yeah. Dogecoin 40,000 and I watched it come all the way back down to six. So I just enjoyed the ride. <laughs> yeah. I would say again, think, have fun thinking through those things. That's how you'll learn to be good at anything. Don't like, 
if you get don't do what i did in my childhood where it's like when i didn't know how to do something keep putting more pressure have to figure this out that's going to be counterproductive there's no you we're guessing like you've already you've done like 99 percent of the thing don't worry about the last one percent like don't split hairs over that would be my recommendation Makes sense? all right thank you so much thank you so much for your time sure anybody else uh anybody got a quick one all right then perhaps uh maybe it's a great time to just say thank you Somebody i was gonna ask one quick uh last question you've alluded to it on some of your shows but basically like uh short-term hedging around um because of the repeated price smashes that go on go on um like basic hedging strategies like I, I, I've been doing short-term puts and that's working quite well, but I don't know if there's more you could elaborate on that. Say the, the I heard something about puts, uh, say that again, please. So because, because of the regular price smashes that happen almost every day, uh, you, have, you have alluded to short-term puts to hedge, um, just as a general hedge. And I was just wondering if you could share your opinion on basic hedging strategies. Um, sure. Uh, my general opinion is that <laughs> uh, stuff that I'd love to be getting back more into, uh, there's a lot of stuff trading wise that I don't really trade that much these days, kind of all the stuff with Arcadia. Remember maybe a year, maybe probably even longer, two years ago, there was like some point where it was like, all right, if I'm going to like get the book out build the channel or create a business be doing these things it was like like i can't do all these and trade and research the stocks and all of it so i've kind of put a lot of things like that on hold and it's like you know when i spot something that i'm like all right i think something's coming up here you know um now with that said actually uh um what's it I would, there's a ton of stuff I'd love to start, you know, researching. And that's uh, some of the, if you've seen some of the old option calls, my former futures and option teacher, who's a quant, um, we're actually, he's actually ready to go calculating this stuff. I just need a good data source um, where I can get uh, intraday price feed. Um, wanted to calculate stuff like every time Actually, here's an interesting one. Every time silver drops by 50% or more in less than 10 minutes, isolate those out. Is there anything you can extrapolate? What happens in the half hour before that? You know, there's probably, everything's an algorithm. Everything's a code. Humans are on autopilot and these guys are no different. I don't know. Maybe you could find like, oh, every time the thing goes like this, then watch out. Um I just haven't been able uh, to balance getting that all calculated. Uh, I mean, there's a bunch of these companies. I'll bet, you know, if you like valued the metal they had in the ground, let's say the thing's $8 stock, you know, even if the thing was liquidated and sold off into bankruptcy and you took all the metal, that would be worth $6. So if some idiot from a bank smashes a silver price and his stock gets crushed and goes down to $4, you know, if you've sold the six strike put, you know, there's going to be some number of times you don't get a sign. Well, this wouldn't be, this would be the opposite of hedging. This would be the other direction. But I mean, let's say I know fundamentally, like if the company got liquidated, it's worth $6 and it's trading at eight. Hey, maybe I sell the six strike put for 50 cents, X out of 10 times, you know, nothing happens. Some number out of 10 times it goes lower, but you know, hey, my worst case scenario, you know, if I'm collecting 50 cents, you know, I'm essentially buying the stock for 550. And even if it was liquidated, it was six bucks. I think you can find stuff like that if you know your stocks well. And I mean, because the people pricing this stuff, they don't know it. They don't have the first clue. We were talking about Jeff Curry, you know? So um, now in terms of hedging, uh, if I had the same setup, and actually, I will leave. Uh, here's one final note. I will leave. I was thinking about mentioning this before. When I was trading for Susquehanna, so I guess, to, actually, let me stop. To finish answering your question, yes, there are a lot of things you could do. Test them. Track data. 
I'd like to be doing more like that, hopefully in future calls. Uh, if there are people who are interested in projects like that, uh, let's see, uh, perhaps uh, the big silver short at arcadeeconomics.com. If you're interested in stuff like that, when I get around to that, uh, send a message there and I don't know when, but we'll get a list of people who can discuss that. Certainly, I'd love to have more help with that. Uh, and then back on the other lines of what I was about to say, when I was trading for Susquehanna, that was the market maker. So essentially you see that bid in the offer that that was me for certain stocks. And I remember the guys that were there a little earlier before I was, you know, who were there during the dot, I got there in 2005 and like some of these guys were around for the dot com bubble where, I mean, like when you have a mania, I remember one guy was like, you had to be a moron not to make a fortune. Cause it's like, if you're the bid ass spread and it's just like, they're selling at a dime, buying it for 20 cents, selling back and forth and you're capturing that spread, you know? So I've been thinking in recent months, it's so like right now I'm just using a TD Ameritrade account. So I'm sure there's some way I could sell vol. I mean, it's a little bit tougher when you're only able to get long vol because we didn't even dig into that parameter, but even if the stock doesn't move, your option price can change whether vol goes up or down. So what I've been thinking about more, I think I would only do if I had the right team because I'm also, again, it's been great all the things that have been happening. I'm also realizing in terms of being able to do it going forward and have an enjoyable life. The last 42 years, I've been trying to get like 30 hours of stuff done per 24 hour day, which, you know, a little stretches can be helpful, but um, yet with that said, thought about putting together a setup where I mean, like, geez, if the guys pricing these options, they don't know cost of production. They don't know any of this stuff. I know that because I was that guy. And towards the end of the time there, I, I was a specialist for 600 symbols. There was shit I didn't know what the, the ticker stood for. Because like a lot of the options, you're trading the mathematical relationships um, so I've thought, oh, that's kind of interesting now between what I've learned about silver, you know, I don't, I mean, I still consider myself a student to like David Morgan, Dave Kranzler, David Smith, Chris Marchese, Rob Keynes, the guys that, you know, really know these stocks well, but I have access to them. So I've thought about replicating if I could stream quotes, which there's always a way or somebody to partner with and, uh, so this is uh, a thought, not a formal offer yet, but depending on where life goes, if maybe that felt like the right thing to do and having some other people that, you know, I started training, knew what they were doing and started to learn so that that way it could be a way that I could supervise without having to think get out of control, but also not need to be by a screen at all points in time. It's something I'm thinking about and I will reserve my right to change my mind about. But with all of that said, if there's someone who's really interested in option trading and perhaps being part of something like that, I'll say send an email to the big silver short at arcadeeconomics.com. Uh, I cannot promise when I will be able to respond. I get a lot of messages these days and do my best to get to all of them and still keep the other stuff going. Uh, but just something I've been thinking about and um you know and if it's the right fit at the right time and all that sure it will play itself out the right way but again more importantly hopefully you guys just had fun i mean if it feels like it's like you know you're going to the dentist listening to this stuff and don't trade options in fact don't do anything in life that you know you're not having fun doing because that i find makes it really hard to get through the times where you're getting clobbered over the head if I didn't genuinely love this silver stuff, I would have quit a long time ago. That's the nice thing. Anyone, and he's even this, and you know, I was talking to someone today, you know, a lot of the different people in the silver industry, what I think is really going to be so already is special about this. You know, you guys are a special subset. I'm not saying that because you watch my show, but anyone that, you know, in a world where, you know, all the stuff that's going on and everyone's chasing the stock bubble, and, you know, you would have made a lot more money over the last decade putting your money in the stock market than silver. 
and it's not easy to sit through. I think he's going to pay off for you in the end. And I think the people that are still in this, uh, you know, have de you, you've developed far more skills than I think any of us could possibly know. I think he'll be rewarded, but you know, that's, if I didn't really enjoy it or wasn't, yeah, you know, but there was a couple of times where, you know, I ran out of money while I was doing it and other sources of money came and it was just, it's just like, this is the most, damn fascinating thing that i've ever seen and it, like somehow i came to the conclusion oh my god i've been wrong all this time and here's what i've been missing then maybe i'd, I'd move on uh i don't know i mean I, I, it'll always be part of my life i i'm excited uh there's a lot of other special things we've been doing behind the scenes that you know i looking forward to mixing in not that i won't talk about silver but I think also yeah the things manipulated and there's things that are frustrating uh also i want to shift my focus towards you know how do we make life better how do we go somewhere positive from here uh but you know again uh, i think what kept drawing me back to it was like until this got resolved like you know and now it's the now it feels like we're in the playoffs the action's heating up and it was just uh, hard to walk away for me and you know, whether that I think most of the people here feel some level of that about silver, but whether options, silver, you know, if you want to play ping pong or you, that's, that's another thing I'm excited to share that someone, I don't know if it, Yara can attest to this. I don't know if there were more, any people who might've been more scared or fearful of certain parts of the entrepreneurial process before they had figured it out. Um, but the idea, and actually we do have a new show debuting soon on the Arcadia Network called The Silver Apprentice. Um, the fact that now what I've gone through and that figured out, <laughs> figured out how to monetize talking about silver manipulation any night. And one of my favorite parts is that I looking forward to being able to help people, whatever it is, their passion in life. Hey, here's some steps to walk through tonight. We did option training, but if someone, you know, there's a, you know, the guy is going to be season one of the silver apprentice is the 17 year old guy, Alexander, the great Horat, who's been on the show the guy at age 14, wrote a book on how to fix the politics of California. And he's like, Hey, Chris, can you help me uh, monetize this, get sponsors? And that someone as talented as him would be asking my advice. And then I actually think I have some things to share that could be helpful and that we're creating that into a show that, other people are going through that process because there are going to be a lot of people coming out of corporate America, scared out of their wits. Um, so anyway, just a lot of fun stuff uh, that I'm looking forward to. And I really appreciate each and every one of you that's been a part of this because, uh, you know, it's, it's really been quite life changing for me. So I thank you all for being a part of it. Hopefully you had fun tonight and, uh, you know, we'll see uh, what happens in a couple of weeks. And if someone does become the 99 million ounce an air, uh, you know, have a party, let me know. And again, uh, final disclaimers, we wrap up if anyone's tuning in late. None of this is legal financial advice. This is my research. It's genuine. I can promise you that. But please, you know, be careful. If you're going to put options on, know that there is risk. Um, but hopefully this was helpful in terms of how to start learning not how to price those risks because you know even like the cftc and all this other stuff it's unfortunate but at least know the risks that are out there and who is or isn't protecting you and with that said uh i am going to wish everyone a good night and uh will be fun times going forward and thank you for being here